Um, just wanted to say welcome to the 41st annual statewide historic preservation conference and this session titled ruins of a forgotten highway survey and documentation of historic water control features in the St. Croix River. My name is David Mather. I'm the National Register archaeologist at the State Historic Preservation Office in Minnesota, and I'll be serving as moderator for this session. For all participants in today's session, if you experience any technical issues, please use the private chat function to send a message. This session is being recorded and will be available for on demand viewing. As a registrant, you will automatically receive access to the recording after the session is completed. We've set aside time at the end of this session for Q&A and we'll get to questions as time allows. To ask a question, please use the Q&A function, which will be on the right side of your screen. As we begin, we want to recognize that Minnesota history spans at least 13,000 years. The vast majority of that time is represented by American Indian history alone. And from that perspective, our urban and rural built environments are very recent. The state of Minnesota, as it's been known since 1858, is with the, within the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Ojibwe peoples. The 11 tribal nations in Minnesota are our partners in advocating for recognition and protection of the state's cultural resources, along with other native nations with historical connections here. SHPO is currently in the final stages of updating our statewide historic preservation plan for the next decade. Among other goals, we seek to broaden the scope and equity of historic preservation through identification and historical designation of more properties important to tribes and underrepresented communities, including traditional cultural properties, cultural landscapes, archaeological sites, and buildings and structures. We encourage you to be part of this effort to work with us and others to build partnerships and advance historic preservation efforts across the state. And now I'd like to introduce our presenters, all of whom are with the National Park Service. Um, Jonathan Moore is with the Cultural Resources Program, excuse me, is the Cultural Resources Program Manager for the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway. David Conlon is the Chief Archaeologist at the Submerged Resources Center, and Dan Ott is the Cultural Resources Program Manager at the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area. If you'd like to learn more about our presenters, you can find their detailed bios and contact information on the Minnesota SHPO Conference homepage. And with that, um, I'll turn it over first to Dan Ott, um, who will start the presentation. I think actually we're going to, we got a little convoluted on this. I'm going to let Jonathan as the host, the home park of the resource, uh, give us a, a brief lead in before I start uh, babbling away. Sounds great. Jonathan, then. thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, good afternoon. Um, and thank you to everyone who has joined us for this presentation about the historic water control features of the St. Croix River. As Dave said, my name is Jonathan Moore and I work at the St. Croix National Scenic Riverway on the Minnesota-Wisconsin border. The riverway includes 230 miles of the St. Croix and Namakagan rivers, and it was designated a unit of the National Park System under the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act of 1968. The portion of river that we'll be talking about today from Taylor's Falls, Minnesota down to Stillwater was added to that riverway designation in 1972. I do want to acknowledge that while I'm helping present today, much of what we know about these historic wing dams, revetments, and bank improvements is due to the work of many others. Two of those individuals are my fellow presenters today. Dan Ott did the bulk of the archival research around this topic, and Dave Conlin oversaw the field investigations in and on the river in 2015. So it's wonderful to have their firsthand experience and expertise with us uh, for this presentation. Uh, we also want to acknowledge the contributions of my predecessor, Gene Sheffy Anderson, whose initial curiosity about these features and many years of observation in the field became the catalyst for the entire project. And we also want to acknowledge the National Park Service's Midwest Archaeological Center in Lincoln, Nebraska for their contributions to this project as well. With that, uh, let me pass the baton to Dan Ott, who will take us back in time to the head scratching moment when the National Park Service wondered what these mysterious objects were and how that riddle got solved. Dan. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, move on to the next slide. 
Um, really, this thing starts in 2007, as uh, Jonathan has pointed out. Um, Gene Sheppy Anderson, his predecessor at the park, had been on the river for a couple decades uh, and came out of an inter background and was really used to getting out there and paddling it. And 2007 was a low water year, and the low water revealed some strange things to her. Uh, in particular, um, she saw around Osceola Landing, below Osceola Landing, while she was paddling with um, Jill Medlin, the NEPA specialist at that time, also now retired, um, a variety of sort of uh, fingers sticking into the river made out of quarry stone. Uh, here's one of them you can see, although I'm not really sure uh, if this is from that time or if Jonathan just had this picture taken last week. Um, also a little water this year, as you know. Um, but yeah, so she found these things uh, in the river. She had never seen them before. People began to ask questions about what they were. She got out there and looked at them, took some GIS data points, and began to sort of, you know, speculate, like, what's the possibilities here? They're certainly not glacial deposits, right? They're very clearly linear lines. They're very clearly, like, uh, quarry rock. They're very clearly intentionally laid down timbers in some instances. Um, but we're not really sure uh, where they came from. And so she sort of started this project by finding them, documenting them, and just general conversation with lots of people speculating about what does this tell us about the history of the river? What context can this sort of connect us to? Uh, next slide. And she sort of speculated that there's a variety of possible explanations for this thing. Um, Jonathan, did you, there we go. Um, you know, as you know, on the St. Croix River, most people know, um, the St. Croix River is famous for its sort of logging industry from 1837 when we had plenty of lumber there until 1914 when literally everything was cut down, right? So there's a possibility it's associated with lumber companies. Uh, lumber companies did a lot of river manipulation. They put in a lot of dams. They did all sorts of work. I recently re-looked up a stat that I like to share with Jonathan every so often uh, from Ted Karamansky's book, uh, Northwoods River. Um, the the St. Croix watershed began with 165 miles of navigable river. By the time the lumberjacks were done with it, there were 820 navigable miles of the St. Croix River watershed because they had done so much modification. So Jean's first thought was probably the lumber companies did this. They were out there doing lots of work. Maybe it's the uh, St. Croix Boom Company. They, they had a buy, a buy state charter to build stuff around Stillwater to facilitate the movement of lumber. Maybe it's the steamboat industry. You know, there's lots of possibilities, but no, and, and just sort of rooted in what people already knew about the place through conversation with locals, conversation with subject matter experts, and conversations with local historical societies. Right, maybe it's um, state agency like fishery, DNR fisheries in either state. Maybe it's the Army Corps of Engineers or some other federal entity. Um, but really never got beyond contextual speculation without sort of a next step, right? We can find a thing and we can, we can sort of um, be armchair sort of philosophers about what that thing might be, but the, the rubber hits the road when we start to actually put into motion sort of a plan of research to figure it out. Uh, and that didn't happen until 2012 when she found a seasonal uh, grad, a seasonal park ranger who is also a graduate student in history, who's me, um, to, was interested in doing some research over the summer. And that's sort of when she picked me up and turned me on to this story, this possibility, and said, hey, here's all the things that we could possibly look into. What do you think? Um, and I don't remember if I dove in first to lumber companies or what, but very quickly, uh, next slide. I wound up digging into the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, this is the great thing about doing research in the 21st century, is that Google Scholar or Google Books in like the early 2000s, mid 2000s, digitized like everything that was copyright, that was out of copyright within like 10 Research One libraries across the country, uh, including things like uh, government reports. And so every single Army Corps of Engineer annual report uh, as letters to the Secretary of War is online and you can search it by keyword. And uh, ultimately I stumbled into this resource which I had no idea existed. Um, started keyword, keyword searching for uh, dams and Croy. Croy is a really great uh, keyword search by the way. Nothing like Mississippi, which is a horrible keyword search. Um, to find that literally every single year from 1875 on to like the 1930s, um, the Army Corps of Engineers not only did work on the St. Croix River, but tabulated how much work they did, 
wrote narratives about why they were doing the work, um, provided economic and logistical data about the, the impact of that work, uh, and really gave like a full scope um, to Congress and to me as a researcher in the year 2012, what they were up to. One, and so you can sort of uh, push this forward, Jonathan, one more. In 1875, they include what are these things they're building and how do you build them? What are their goals? So they literally have drawings of how they would go about building wing dams and closing dams along the river. And these things that they're describing look exactly like the things that Gene took pictures of in 2007. Right, uh, and they're very clearly describing the purpose of these things to improve navigation along the St. Croix to a three foot channel. Because prior to them sort of doing any work, there's plenty of water in the St. Croix River in spring when there's melt and there's a flood and there's a freshet and they're pushing logs through. But by the time you get to August in most years, low water uh, is below a foot and a half. It's a, it's a thin, it's a broad, uh, shallow river full of ripples, braiding through islands, totally unusable from a commercial logging or steamboat standpoint. It's just not a predictable transportation corridor. And so the Army Corps is very clearly saying, these are the things that we need to do to make this a predictable uh, resource, and this is how we're going to do it. Um, next slide, Jonathan. And you can see that they're actually keeping track overall of every single thing they're doing. Um, by the time you get to this, this one's from 1916. Um, they say that they dredged their previously work done beginning in 1878. They dredged approximately 84,000 cubic yards of material out of the St. Croix River. They constructed approximately 19,000 linear feet, which is over three miles of wing dams, dams and bank protections. And they removed about 14,000 snags, stumps and logs. Uh, all in about a 25 mile reach below Taylor's Falls because you couldn't get above the waterfall, Taylor's Falls uh, and St. Croix Falls or the Riffle or whatever you want to call it. Um, but they're giving us a really clear sense of how much work has been done out there, but they're not giving us any maps. They're not really telling us exactly how it worked. Um, they're giving us sort of a, a broad meaning of how they're doing it and why they're doing it, but not necessarily where they're doing it. And another part of this that's very clear as they sort of dig into these things is there's some spots that they actually continually have problems with year over year. Uh, and so some fixes stick and some ones don't as they're manipulating and changing the way the river works. Uh, next slide, Jonathan. The next thing we, oh, this is a cool image from uh, the Mississippi River. Around this time, I start looking into, because I'm still in St. Paul, um, looking into um, similar projects, and certainly the Army Corps did tons of this work, which is really well-known work on the Mississippi River, trying to create a four-foot channel uh, in the 1890s. And you can see this is exactly the sort of process they're going through to create wing and closing dams. They're putting down huge mats of, uh, of brush uh, in the river in straight lines from barges, and then they're weighing all those mats down and holding them in place with quarry rock. Right? We don't have any pictures of any of the stuff that actually happened at the St. Croix uh, in real time, but this is a very similar sort of thing that would be happening um, on the St. Croix. And so this is really, at this point, we're like, yes, this is exactly what these things are. This is how they're being built. This is why they're being built. We were hoping still to figure out if we could get more information about where they are uh, and how they were managed. So we went one step further uh, and wound up at the National Archives down in Chicago, which was really convenient to me because I was down in Chicago for graduate school in the fall of 2012. Uh, and wound up digging around in the Great Lakes uh, Archive down there. What's interesting, oh, Jonathan, did you go to the next slide? There we go. What's interesting about that is as you dig into this, this archival resource, we had a really high level resource in annual reports. And then we have a really low level resource uh, at the National Archives, which is literally the correspondence among uh, the captain of the St. Paul District, Charles Allen, and then his, his um, successors to the people who are actually doing the work about what they want them to do in specific locations. This is actually what Charles Allen tells Oscar Knapp to do to handle um, some of the complications at Cedar Bend um, to wind up closing off some of the back channels so that it can be uh, a better conduit for timber and for, uh, for steamboats. What you can see here uh, is it actually looks really similar to the previous slide. So he's just drawing stuff in the correspondence. It's almost coming straight out of the annual reports, which is sort of interesting. But that's how they're applying this knowledge is they're putting it in practice 
as they're sort of advising the people on the ground doing the work. If you go to the next slide, we also have notebooks of where these guys are handling Oscar Knapp or whoever is handling these trouble spots. So you can see on the left there, this really faint image of Folsom Island, and he's trying to draw what kind of closing dams they're actually building out there to try and control the river so it's going on the, the thicker side of the island so there's more space rather than the current this is right underneath angle rocks it for some reason pitches way to the west hard and goes behind this little narrow channel and they're trying to close that narrow channel because it's actually really bad for moving boats or lumber through it actually creates famously lots of log jams uh, and so they're trying to control that what's funny about the images that you find there is there's nothing beyond this really zoomed in microscopic views of the river overall. There's no overarching map of everything together. We ultimately did find a map of everything in 1937 from the St. Paul District Office of the Army Corps of Engineers, which you can see on the right there. But what you'll what we know about that is they were just surveying structures in place in 1937 and not accounting for stuff that you couldn't find or the ways in which that stuff changed over time because the river as you manipulated it would make adjust adjustments and, and move in unpredictable ways as they're trying to restrain and control nature out there. Um, and that's really sort of one of the more interesting things of this project is once we sort of get into place trying to figure out where things are, it's very evident that you can't really tell from the archival record. Uh, we know that they were doing lots of things in lots of different places, um, but exactly how successful those things were um, is really, really unclear. But we were able to compile a lot of archival research. Uh, and with that level of information, we were get, able to get additional investment from the National Park Service in this project to go to a next level um, to get the Submerged Resource Center team involved out of Denver. Uh, and these sort of things that we were able to gather became sort of the basis for their research design um, and targeting moving forward. So I will pass it off to you, my colleague, Dave. Okay, well, thanks for that setup, Dan. I, uh, my name is Dave Conlon. I'm chief of the National Park Service's Submerged Resources Center. We're a small team. We're a national asset for the National Park Service, and we travel throughout the national park system um, doing underwater archaeology for our parks and our partners. And, uh, you know, I tell people that the good news about my job is, is that we get paid to go scuba diving in national parks. Uh, the bad news about my job is, is more often than not, those places are like Ellis Island or the Hudson River or various toxic waste dumps that have been transformed into national parks. And so, you know, when we got a call and someone, uh, you know, at the parks said, would you and your team consider coming up to, um, you know, the St. Croix River and spending uh, a month in June tootling up and down the river on a pontoon boat, uh, it sounded like heaven to me. And so, of course, we jumped right on that and, and um, you know, uh, said, of course, we'll, we'll come with everything that we've got to try and, and help with this this question. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll offer up a disclaimer. I, I mean, I wouldn't know a log boom if it was lowered on me by by someone. So, I mean, we really look to our colleagues at the park and and um, you know elsewhere to help us with uh, sort of what it is that we're looking for. I mean, our job in some ways we do have our own kind of basis of knowledge involving ship construction and ship design. None of which applies here. Um, so, you know, we kind of fall back on our technical skills, which is uh, locating things underwater, documenting them, and then interpreting them within the, um, you know, the context that's provided to us by parks. And so the, the real trick for us was to go out and see how the archaeological record compared to the historical record that, that Dan and others had done such a great job of finding. And so we were kind of um, out looking to see how those two compared and, and for, for those of you involved in historical archaeology, um, you know that, that the written sources never uh, cohere particularly well with the archaeological sources and that kind of dissonance between um, those two forms of documentation are always areas of interest to us because they explain um, particularly interesting areas of human behavior and human history. So, uh, 
you know, what we came up with in um, a sense was a kind of variation of our standard research design, which is kind of three parts. One is what's there. Uh, the second is what's happening to what's there. And the third is, is what should we do about what's happening to what's there? And, and at this point, even though the project was done um, several years ago, we're still kind of at the what's there phase of things, because I think that, you know, we, we gathered a tremendous amount of information that is of interest. And, um, you know, now we're kind of sitting back and sharing it with you all and, and thinking about what our next steps might be. But let me give you a kind of look behind the scenes at, at what the project actually looked like. If I could have the next slide, please. So this was our principal uh, instrument. This is a, a Klein 3000H, which is a high frequency side scan sonar. Um, and a side scan sonar, what it does is if I can, um, let's see, I've just requested to annotate this drawing here. So um, you can see here and here are two transducers and what the transducers do is they emit a sound pulse. Um, and this is the, the track that we pulled this instrument along. And, and the way to think about a side scan sonar is, is if you drove through the, the north woods of Minnesota or Wisconsin and shined a, a, a searchlight out the side of your car, you would illuminate the front of all of the trees that you saw and and then behind the trees there would be a shadow and that's exactly what we did on the St. Croix River and so what you see here is this this is actually the front side of a wing dam our boat track is not here sorry it's actually here and so what we did is we we took our boat and we drove along and this is the acoustic reflection of the the wing dam here and for those of you who like me, don't know, uh, you know, the difference between a wing dam and a closing dam. A wing dam stretches partially across the river, and what it does is it focuses and concentrates moving water into a smaller, deeper, uh, more quickly running channel that facilitates the movement of logs or, or steamboats. And, and wing dams can be in pairs, they can be single. Um, and then a closing dam closes off a, a a tributary or a channel or runnel to to again refocus the um, the water that's going uh, down the river. Uh, next slide, please. So this is this is great. I mean, this is this is something that I hope when I retire from the park service they'll they'll show me and and they'll say not all of your job was horrible. These are. Some of uh, our archaeologists, including colleagues from the Midwest Archaeological Center, and and what we've got here is is just basic ground investigation of a river control feature that's now overgrown and a little bit difficult to see. And you can see our our research vessel there, um, the park pontoon boat. And and I have to tell you, um, in the the years that I've been working for the Park Service, this project really was a standout. It's absolutely glorious to be on the St. Croix River in June. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, we deployed the, the, the full force of the National Park Service's um, waterborne uh, uh, command and control feature. Here we've got uh, two of our colleagues from the Midwest Archaeological Center kayaking, and we're looking in sort of some of the back channel tributaries for remnants of these water control features. And, you know, some of them are uh, extant, some of them are damaged, and some of them are only traces, and some of them are completely gone. And so um, what we were doing is looking at the uh, historical maps, finding that same location on the river, and then going out and actually looking to see if there were any remains of these features in the water. Next slide, please. Um, and in addition to, uh, you know, above water research, we also, um, because we are underwater archaeologists, we felt we needed to do a little bit of diving. And here's some of our team documenting a, a wooden wing dam. You can see the actual, um, uh, you can see the, um, here are the, the logs that um, make up 
part of the the um, the dam itself stacked on top of each other. And here's another one that's actually underwater. And then you can see also um, just the equipment and 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 some of the stuff that we use to to facilitate the study. Next slide, please. Um, and in addition to, you know, working underwater, our, our colleagues from um, the Midwest Archaeological Center also brought some more traditional uh, terrestrial archaeological tools. So this is uh, Ranger Bob Whaley, and he's got a reflector for a total station. And, and um, this is um, Erin Dempsey with a data recorder, and she's collecting um, more data about this particular, this looks like part of a wing dam feature. Uh, next slide, please. And again, um, you know, some sort of higher tech, uh, both total station and precision survey grade GPS collecting data points, which we turned over to the park as full uh, geographical information system layers. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then, you know, with all the high tech, we also turned to low tech. And so this is a hand drawn map of one of the uh, water control features. And the reason that we did a hand drawn map instead of uh, a photograph or a sonar image or something like that is, is that uh, we truly believe that sometimes old school is the best way to go. And, you know, there are stones and, and, and rocks all over the bottom of the river and the, it really does take kind of an archaeologist's eye and a, a, an understanding of what the actual feature was in order to to draw it and to make sense of it and so by doing a hand-drawn map we can kind of attach archaeological information to what otherwise would look like a, a natural feature of the river next slide please um, and from that, we produced a report, a technical report, and, and what we were looking at was, um, again, what's there. But, uh, you know, I think that's the question for all of us, which is really what started this whole study is, why is it there? And, and I think that, you know, one of my colleagues at the um, Midwest Archaeological Center had the observation said, you know, this is not a bunch of isolated features. This is a system. This is a physical system of water control features that all work together to create a particular outcome um, regarding the water flow in the St. Croix River to be used historically for particular things. And so alteration, as in any kind of system, alteration of any one of the elements of the system uh, has uh, ripple effects for the other things. And so as these water control features change, they change the, the needs and the demands for, for other water control features further downstream. And the whole thing needs to be seen as sort of a dynamic evolving um, effort to control the river to address social, economic, uh, human needs over time that change over time. And these things are reflective of that. Uh, think next slide and I think I will now turn it over to my colleague uh, Jonathan. Thank you, Dave. Uh, so yes, as a result of the rigorous research and the fantastic field work that occurred, the park now knew not only what this assemblage of features was, but the report also started to paint a picture of what kind of features were still extant and how they were distributed across the landscape. And uh, so, and here you kind of see an overall view of uh, the location of the features. And as Dave mentioned, you know, they function together as a system. Uh, the report also suggests that together, these features may constitute a discontiguous district eligible for the National Register of Historic Places under criteria A and or C. So now that we know that they're there, what does that mean? Well, in part, it poses a lot of additional questions, such as, is this the full extent of the features? Uh, given the Army Corps documentation that Dan described, there are probably many more features out there 
uh, either completely integrated into the shoreline or having become part of islands, um, you know, or, or others out there that can still be seen waiting to be identified. What condition are they in and how are they changing? Being largely underwater and in the dynamic environment of a river, um, as we saw from those, uh, those fieldwork photos, these are not always easy questions to answer. Fortunately, uh, this very dry summer that we just had provided uh, a rare opportunity. The severe drought conditions that much of the St. Croix watershed experienced uh, resulted in exceptionally low water conditions in the river. And at least one gauge was lower than it had been 33 years ago in the drought of 1988. This presented the opportunity to get out there and uh, see many of the features topside or above the surface of the water. So the park worked with Two Pines Resource Group and Stratomorph Geo Exploration in late August uh, to obtain additional documentation of these features and their condition. So here in the photo, you see uh, Joe Newski from Two Pines and then uh, Andy Javert from Stratomorph on a wing dam and a closing dam above Boom Island. Um, and this particular island is located upstream of Osceola, Wisconsin. Here on the left, you see Andy walking out on the Boom Island closing dam. Uh, much of which you can see was accessible and visible without even having to get one's uh, feet wet. So, sorry about that, Dave, that, <laughs> that the water was higher when, you, when your group was here. Um, but of course, uh, portions of the features were still submerged, and on the right, you can see that Andy was prepared for that as well. Uh, as you can see, these uh, conditions really made for some excellent photo documentation. Uh, in part because these features that would typically be under three, four, or more uh, feet of water were only under one or two, and with a lack of rain events and reduced runoff into the river, the turbidity was low or the kind of sedimentation within the water column, and therefore cl clarity was high. In addition to providing a clear view of the features, these images also capture the visceral and sublime beauty that many of these possess. Uh, as you can see here, still, we're still at the Boom Island closing dam. At times though, the features can appear somewhat underwhelming, right? Uh, they're made up of modest materials that are commonplace in a river environment, literally logs, sticks, and stones. But in the way that they were constructed, uh, together, they become a more charismatic entity, and the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Because to think that this, uh, this dam that you're seeing on the screen, this culturally created assemblage of log and stone, has held this position in the river you know, for possibly 140 years or more. That's more than 140 freezing and heaving winters, 140 robust spring thaws, 140 long hot summers. And while the river and time have certainly taken their toll, their resiliency is really something to behold. Despite their durability, however, they are not indestructible. One of the most imminent threats that has been observed to these features is human activity. Because at times these features can appear so unassuming, it appear to just be maybe a rock pile, uh, it's possible for people to act on them without realizing that they're mod modifying a century, century old cultural resource. Here on the left, you see something uh, resembling either a cairn or possibly an ad hoc navigation marker uh, composed of rock from the adjacent historic water control feature. On the right, rock has been raided from historic dams to build campfire rings. While seemingly innocent, these types of manipulations can cumulatively over time alter and diminish the features in a way that even the river has not been able to do in over a hundred years time. As we learn more about the features and potential threats to them, 
Uh, we anticipate that interpretation and education will be an important strategy to their stewardship. We will need the public's help to preserve them. So conveying an appreciation and understanding of them to visitors is crucial. The system's historical significance uh, certainly should inspire and capture the public's imagination as these features helped move over 15 billion, that's with a B, billion board feet of timber downstream. Uh, just like these branded logs here that were cut and put into the river uh, probably over, over a century ago, and this summer could be observed still making their way downstream towards Stillwater. It's also the case that many of these features are still performing their historic function. Much of the recreation people enjoy on the river today, whether it's by pontoon, fishing boat, canoe, or kayak, is made possible or at least enhanced by the presence of these features. A big reason that these sections of river were still passable in a drought year like this one is because these dams, jetties, and revetments continued to do what they were put in the river to do. The continued presence of these water control features also reveal an essential truth about this, quote, wild and scenic river, unquote. And that is that there is often more than meets the eye. Rather than untouched nature, today's river is a culturally modified landscape that has been worked and reworked by the hands and for the purposes of people. And with that, we, uh, the three of us want to thank you for joining us on this journey. And we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that folks have, or if, uh, if you'd like us to speak more to any of the ideas or issues we've shared, um, now would be the time to do that. So a reminder to um, participants, if you have a question, just type it into the Q&A um, function and then um, I'll, I'll read out the questions just to make sure everybody hears them and, um, and we'll see how that goes. I see a comment. Great presentation, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. I think with great photographs, it's pretty easy to do a, a pretty good presentation. So let's give credit where credit's due here. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. While we're waiting for other questions, I have a question or two. Um, I think Jonathan, you mentioned National Register eligibility. Are there plans to do a nomination? Um, and I guess I'll, I'll I'll pile on my my related question. Um, did it, throughout this process did um, was the area of the um, Saint Croix boom site examined the National Historic Landmark? And um, and I'll pile on a third. Is I mean if this stuff is all created, is this potential a potential basis for updating the National Historic Landmark? designation. And by the NHL designation, you mean off the St. Croix boom site? Correct. Yeah. Um, let's see, I'll, I'll take a pass at your questions in reverse order. Um, at the boom site, the answer is yes. What's interesting is the current boundary for the NHL at the St. Croix boom site largely focuses on the area on top of the bluff that actually supported the boom operations uh -huh. um, and, and that the nomination never fully included or looked at um, the water channel that was act that where they were actually stopping, sorting, and handling the logs. And so I think, uh, you know, absolutely, there's there's the potential now for this to inform a, a more comprehensive um, and inclusive NHL designation. And in 2015. Um, the, the team did extensive side sonar um, through that through that area to get additional information. Um, and we did 
We did revisit that area uh, in August um, because of very limited time and wanting to take advantage of the, the window of opportunity. Um, we really revisited the targets that were identified in 2015 at the boom site. Gotcha. Um, but with some additional information um, was gleaned. And then as it relates to uh, a nomination for this, I, uh, yes, it's very safe to say that uh, a nomination for this discontinuous district um, is in the future. I might uh, defer to Dave Conlon just to speak again to the questions that the Submerged Resources Center kind of thinks through. And and then he can kind of reflect on where he thinks we are within that uh, sequence. Nice. Well, I, I think that, um, that Rebecca's question, how many features were you able to document the summer? I, I, that's a question for Jonathan. The original report focused on 20 separate areas. Um, and I do know that the uh, we spent some time at the boom site. And uh, my recollection is is that there wasn't a lot in the water, and I think that the the problem that we see in a in a place like that is is a, a sort of valuable industrial prop property gets worked and reworked over time, and so things that that were there that were central to the functioning of of the you know the boom operation itself get pulled out and get replaced by steamboat anchorages or something like that. Um, so, uh, you know. I'm not sure. I, I do believe that extending the the NHL boundaries would be appropriate, um, and I think that we do have some side scan sonar to to support some of that. So that that would be something. Um, I think that in terms of where we are for doing a, uh, a district nomination for national register, I think we're pretty well along. I mean, I think that really. Uh, we have a lot in hand, um, you know, certainly the research that Dan has done and, and Jonathan has continued and others have have done is really um, compelling and worthwhile. I don't think that we have a complete picture of what everything um, like where everything is or what remains in the river. And I'm not sure that. Um, that's necessary for the nomination. I mean, we can sketch out an area and, you know, highlight sort of um, kind of key features that are exemplars of closing dams, wind dams, and, and so on. So that would be um, that would be worthwhile. And uh, you know, to clarify what our role is, is we are we're technicians and we are advisors to to our national parks. So when we work in a park. We work at the pleasure of the superintendent and the resource manager. So, um, you know, while Jonathan is nice to kind of lateral that question to me, I, I'm going to put it back in his lap and say that if that's something that the park is interested in, um, we will work with with the park to make that possible. Um, One thing I'll add is. Um, even without a full nomination having been completed, um, as when at the park, when we make management decisions and do uh, environmental compliance on undertakings that we have, uh, already we've been able to use the uh, information that was learned in 2015, and then we'll be adding this 2021 documentation to it. And um, we have been treating any known features as eligible you know, under section 106 undertakings that we um, have already done. And then when we've been consulting on other agencies undertakings um, within the Riverway, uh, we've done a similar thing that we've, uh, those compliance processes have been very much informed um, by all of the work that we've discussed today. I, I sort of wanted to take a, a second to respond to Lisa's question. What it, Additional study or research would you recommend next to continue to learn about these features? Uh, in the world of inter interdisciplinary study, my colleague, um, Allie Holt Hewson, is actually studying the ways in which endangered freshwater mussels make use of these artificial wing dams uh, to create habitats and they become beds, very productive beds because of slack water and the way that they manipulate water um, for freshwater mussels. And that's something that um, 
Allie is undertaking with support from the mid and, and Allie is the, uh, the lead for the Midwestern regions dive team and also a, um, a natural resource specialist here at the Mississippi national river and recreation area. So that's one way that this is actually really fascinating is that they're a part of the river so much so that they actually are not only changing it, but they are now becoming integrated as part of the richer, more dynamic habitat of what is a quote wild river. Um, and that's one of the really, really cool things to sort of think about. And I always find really fun is that uh, on the river, you know, as Jonathan's sort of conclusion was, is like, we think of it as being this sort of pristine and clean river and many of the same way as the Park Service and Gaylord Nelson talked about it when it was founded in 1968 and 72. Um, but as you learn more about these things, like you don't see them at all because you don't think about them. And as soon as you learn about them, you can't not see them anymore and you can't stop seeing the human intervention that is just below the surface, the closing dams, the ways in which you got rid of some slack water and the closing of sloughs, like the narrowing of the river. And it's just sort of continually there. And it's not just for our observation, but sort of continually there as part of that ecosystem. Um, and I don't think, and Dave, this is a question for you, um, but I don't think that they found any diagnostic artifacts other than the fact that all these artifacts pretty clearly came from you know, a series of very conscientious, well-documented, um, or fairly well-documented activities by the Army Corps and their um, subcontractors. Fun yeah. fact, uh, lumberjacks also wound up participating with these Army Corps operations for like 10 days at a time, and like looking for seasonal labor, and like throw some stuff in the river, make some money and take off. So a little bit of, so little bit of social history there for you. I, I, yeah, you know, we're not, typically in the artifact recovery business, which makes us a little bit unusual for archaeologists. Um, you know, artifacts recovered from underwater require a colossal amount of conservation um, to stabilize them. And so we typically do not recover anything. But Andy, in, in response to your question, we didn't find anything, as Dan said, beyond the kind of, you know, the 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 materials that they were made of and the and the fashion in which they were made, um, you know, to indicate how old each individual feature was. And I think that there may be um, some variation, uh, you know, between different features. The, the, the real, the archeological and anthropological question is, is that because of the individuals that were doing it? Is that because of changing contract specifications for the Corps of Engineers or is it uh, you know, something else altogether. Um, so I think that, you know, I, I, I am both a victim of and uh, react against the, the continuous scientific response, which is, you know, further research is always indicated because I think that for our national parks at some point in time, we have to kind of say, okay, this is, this is the amount of effort that we're going to put into this question. But that's that's absolutely something that you know could be looked into additionally and then um jacob your question about will there be future remote sensing in previously unstudied portions of the river um jonathan and i were talking the other day exactly about what the next steps would be and i think that a lidar which is a, a airborne laser uh study of the river during low water could cover a huge area of the river and give us some much more um, granular ideas about what's there and, and, you know, what's going on. And then the other thing, too, is I think that looking at um, Andy's underwater and, and topside pictures from, you know, last month, uh, you know, getting uh, permission to use a drone on the river and getting some low level aerial photography of some of these features would would be great for management and also for interpretive um, purposes. So, uh, and, and then the, the last thing I'll say is, is, you know, I think that it's really easy in, in our day and age of, of highways um, to forget about how difficult transiting across the countryside of, of sort of woodland Minnesota and Wisconsin actually was back in the day. I mean, back when horse paths, uh, you know, and game trails were a, a primary means of communication, moving large amounts of material and people 
uh, and equipment in a regular way and, and getting a, a large amount of those things from point A to point B was not a trivial uh, undertaking at all. And, and long before the railroads um, penetrated this area, long before roads were, were made, the rivers were the highways. The, they really were a way to move massive quantities of very bulky, very heavy things around from one place to another. And it's, you know, we look at the, the history of, of Wisconsin and Minnesota, you can trace the, the sort of rise and fall of communities and local histories based on, you know, improvements in, in land borne communication and, and road building and, and railway building. And I think that what's driving roads and railways in its early phases um, is the same thing that drove the creation of wing dams and, and closing dams, which is a regular and dependable way that people can count on of getting from one place to another and moving their things from one place to another. And if, if you look at dependability, um, you know, the river is, is fairly dependable, but a, a railroad is much more dependable than that. And so we see a kind of shift and a move towards um, something that people can count on for the purposes of planning for commerce, for, for communication and those sorts of things. And, and I think that, um, you know, when we look at the, the, the physical structures that we see in the river, what we're really looking at is an effort on the part of the people that lived in the area to regularize the ability to use that river. Wonderful, thank you. Um, another question from Lisa, what are the top one or two priority messages you would like those using the river to know about these features? I would say some of the key messages is, um, aren't they cool? <laughs> <laughs> and, they are. Uh, I mean, and, and isn't it awesome that 140 years, uh, you know, or at least, you know, some of them are 100 years later, that they're still there to behold and that many of them are still influencing um, how the river behaves and that the river is, is acting on them. Um, so, you know, aren't they cool? Uh, enjoy them, look at them, celebrate them, um, but please don't, uh, please don't harm them or change them. Mm -hmm. Nice, thank you. And a question from Dylan, are these features being assigned Minnesota or Wisconsin site members? Maybe both. <laughs> as of right now, I, uh, I think as a result of the 2015 work and the, and the uh, 2021 work, um, site forms have not been uh, created for all of the individual locations. That would be something that um, you know, with dealing with the kind of sense of the whole, uh, that I think we would look at documenting it, uh, in that way. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. So, um, I have, a, you know, we, we got together as a team to kind of discuss our presentation on 2 previous occasions. And, and I think that 1 of the, we had some pretty interesting conversations. I'd like to kind of share with the audience if we can, um. Dan, your your comment about looking through the correspondence and seeing these these closing dams closing off, what were they called? Useless tributaries or something like that? Can useless channels? Useless channels. Let's let's talk a little bit about that because I think it's fascinating. I mean, what what were they saying? I mean, what you essentially have from the the Army Corps reports and the correspondence is a real clear sense. That the only thing that matters about the river is how predictable, how normalized is it for um, for navigation? And navigation is very explicitly defined: navigation for steamboats, navigation for logs. That's what matters here. Making a regularized, you know, what can you, you know, set a watch to um, as close to a train as possible, I suppose, right? And they're making these decisions about 
a qualitative decisions about what matters in nature, what matters in the river, what matters in the valley, because of what matters to them culturally about economics of that, right? And um, and dependability and logistics. And so they're they're just missing the ways in which that resource is used, that a, a useless channel, a useless backwater, a slough, um, you know, a, a sort of slack water area, how that is, is going to be, um, how that functions as habitat, how that functions as a place where resources thrive. For example, it's pretty easy to predict based on not that they describe this, but reading that those documents against the grain, it's very easy to say like, oh, the, they, they killed areas where wild rice used to be abundant because they cut them off from water and dried it all up, right? And so those are the sort of things that you can really sort of begin to think about is how does the modification of the riverway also lead to, which they're thinking of in hydrological terms, also then think of, become part of modification of the larger ecosystem. And I think that that's one of those things that they're, you know, they're doing because that's, you know, their priority is on navigation, but they're constantly sort of making these decisions um, without really a lot of concern, um, but with very lasting um, repercussions. Was the, the kind of creation of these wing dams, closing dams and modification of the river, was it uh, sort of agreed upon throughout the local community or was it contentious people were saying hey this is my favorite fishing spot or uh, is there any indication of that in the historical record at all i mean if there is it's i don't think that the uh the army corps was doing a rigorous public planning process in the year 1883 right um there's generally just a sense that like this is a good idea this is this is what matters in the core there the most contention you get um is there are complaints from steamboat steamboaters about the logs and the law and the loggers about the steamboaters and the army corps never really resolves that except to say that they do have a lot of things that the st croix boom company and lumberjacks have put in the river that screws up navigation that they have to go back later and clean out because so at osceola landing used to have the first st croix boom and they're like oh we need a better spot down river that's closer to the head of nav or the the mouth of the head of Lake St. Croix, they just move down there and they leave all the stuff in the river. You know, so the St. Croix or the uh, the Army Corps people complain that there's just garbage left in the river, which is always sort of a complaint uh, of rivers prior to you know the environmental movement of the 1960s and 1970s, as people just leave stuff everywhere and let the river take care of itself or whatever that means, um, and move their garbage away. But um, there is that sort of piece of this, um, but there's never really a sense that like oh. You know, there's pushback from the Army Corps making these changes. There's general support. I mean, the St. Croix River Improvement Association is broadly, before prior to it becoming one of the leading champions of environmental stewardship in the riverway, um, you know, they're in favor of just making that river more useful and making it more um, more attractive and viable for any sort of commercial investment. If that's tourism, great. If that's steamboating, great. If it's whatever, they're they're really broadly supportive. Uh, and so I don't think there's necessarily that sort of um, pushback or that sort of resistance um, that you might easily predict today. I mean, we're having conversations in the Mississippi about what should be done with locks and dams. And there is a lot of thoughts on that topic from a variety of corners. Do you keep up? Well, the Army Corps doesn't use them for navigation anymore, but do you keep them because they're, they're part of what the built landscape is since the 1930s? Do you remove them to restore a wild river? What does a wild river mean? Um, but yeah, there's not, there's none of that. Um, back then, it seems very, um, very straightforward. And, and I think it would be fair to say that that concerns about traditional use were not given much, <laughs> um, much thought at that particular point in time. Is that fair to uh, say? For sure, right? Like, there's, there's definitely a, a clear cut dismissal of it. Uh, indigenous and tribal ways of knowing and understanding that resource. There's no doubt that um, tribal people participate, Ojibwe people participate in the logging industry and, and sort of um, become river pigs and they become lumberjacks and they sort of um, weave their way into a colonizing, Americanizing uh, lumber industry sort of thing. Um, but they're also doing it on their own terms. And certainly they're just doing it, um, you know, as, as a means to sort of get along rather than um, sort of thinking of it in terms of a really, you know, big picture. They're not like full partners in the project of, of extracting timber, right? They're sort of um, getting fringe benefits as just sort of 
survival subsistence, um, you know, additional wages and this sort of thing. But yeah, those, those, those are great ways of thinking about about what these things mean uh, up there and what they mean to the community up there and various communities up there um, is it's much, much broader um, than sort of just the Army Corps making decisions on behalf of, you know, logging and navigation. They have lasting repercussions that we still have, as Jonathan has pointed out. Well, they're still out there today and they still make a difference for how people enjoy and experience that river um, because you still have a floatable channel to go and enjoy as you fly fish or you're um, canoeing or whatever, or tubing. And, and Dave, what I'd say from um, what I've read from the historical record, it, it generally seemed like what the Army Corps, uh, you know, documented were those concerns that they maybe considered their constituents, which largely were seemed to be commercial interests, whether it was um, steamboats or uh, lumber interests. But but I think one interesting uh, Kind of subtlety is that that even among lumber interests, you could uh, some of the decisions they'd make or things that they were trying to prioritize could create small local conflicts. Such as um, there was some correspondence regarding, you know, a small sawmill that had a small mill pond, and and the way that the river was being um, uh, controlled was actually you know was kind of preferencing the movement of logs from upstream to downstream and you know was was going to adversely affect this very small mill pond and in that case you know the army corps kind of took that into account um, but there's not a lot of recognition that that they were looking at the broader um, implications of you know of, of channelizing the river in this way well and, and that goes back to the sort of systemic nature of of the water control features, because I, I imagine if we had been there, there was probably a fair amount of informal discussion and jockeying amongst the various logging concerns up and down the river, because the placement of one water control feature um, in one place versus another probably had significant operational impacts on, you know, how much effort it took to to move logs into um, you know, landing areas or, or boom areas versus others. And so, it, you know, I, I would not be surprised if there was a fair amount of kind of discussion or, or, or lobbying to, you know, move this wing dam upstream of my place because it helps me out versus move it downstream, um, you know, because it helps out my competitors or something like that. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit more of that. Um, you know, the Army Corps didn't walk away from the river when the when the logging era ended in 1913, when rivers uh, when they stopped sending river, uh, logs downstream. The Army Corps continued to you know have an interest in the river, and there were other interests that continued to um, visualize how the river could be manipulated, uh, such that there were still proposals, um, maybe not salient ones, but people were still exploring could a could a lock be incorporated into the St. Croix Falls Dam to extend navigation upstream, much in the way you know, that it was done at like St. Anthony Falls on the Mississippi. And so in that in that era, you start to see more of the community voices starting to place a value on um, you know, scenic beauty, recreation, um, you know, and ecology. And and uh, and so you start to see that conversation play out. Uh, you know, well before the creation of the riverway, which wouldn't come until 1968. Um, so I do think that's an interesting time period uh, to study as well, being that the Army Corps continued to be a player, um, but I think people's thinking about the river and how, and, uh, and their conceptualization of it, you know, was starting to evolve. I mean, I would say there's, there's some really interesting things you find in the Army Corps records um, as well. Like there's a plan um, at the end of the progressive era to create a, a canal system using the St. Croix going across like a crazy system across to like the Boise Brule River to get to the, uh, to get to Lake Superior and then like kind of a whole sort of mess of canals to get around um, the upper Midwest through Wisconsin and Minnesota. And sort of these ideas that like maybe this is a cheap alternative water transportation is a cheap alternative to railroad transportation and you can break away from those 
sort of um, those monopolistic controls by industry of railroads. Um, and they float these ideas. You know, they, um, they, they, the Army Corps takes them seriously and they survey and they get funding from Congress to go run around out there and say, this is what that would look like. This is how many locks would be a lift to go from the head riders of the St. Croix across the continental divide down the Boise Brule, right? Like that's what it would take. And, um, and, uh, and it's interesting because you, when you look at those records, you can sort of see the ways in which water transportation does at some moment represent sort of uh, a way of the past, but also sort of a populistic sort of cheaper way forward um, that is entertained for a little while. And you can see a little bit of the controversy perhaps in how people think about those things uh, from a social standpoint uh, in those documents, because they do wind up sort of revealing that they are pondering and, you know, society is interested and so much so that Congress is directing the Army Corps to look into um, alternative ways of organizing um, resources to for the for the greater public benefit, um, but you don't really have those same those same sort of conversations live about local state land like local landowners about um, wing dams because they're undoubtedly happening on a more informal, less documented basis. I mean, certainly someone would benefit if you wind up expanding navigation northwards. Everyone along you know along up there would be thrilled uh, for new. For new commercial opportunities, or everyone who's relate, who's concerned with commerce would be thrilled. I should say. Certainly, there's a lot of people to be. Today's people in the state, upper Saint Croix would be horrified because they love their uh, their fishing and their very pleasant, calm, small river. But you know, at that time, could be something different. I think one of the other. I, I don't want to monopolize <clears throat> um, this conversation. If there are questions, please please chime in. But. <clears throat> I think one of the other things that we talked about, which I thought was worth sharing or worth visiting on just for a moment was, you know, this river was designated as a wild and scenic river in 1968. Um, but how wild was it? How wild is it? How, 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 how do we sort of think about that in, in this particular point in time? Did we even understand what we were doing when we, when we made this designation? Um, as a wild and scenic river. Yeah, it's fascinating to think about. And, and to the me, the idea of untrammeled wilderness and wild and scenic, and it's just fascinating. Yeah. And, um, and one question that, that I've gotten that uh, hopefully I'm answering with this next slide with our contact information. Um, I have gotten a couple of questions about how can you know people get more information about the work that was done in 2015 and then again in 2021. Um, uh, right now, the best way might just be to contact me via email um, with specific questions you have. And you know, one thing that's really excited, excited about these cultural resources is that often in the field of archaeology, um, we're restricted with what we can share with the public about the nature and location of, ar of archaeological resources. Uh, because of state and federal regulations. In the case of uh, this body of work, um, you know, because you can, they're there in the river to see, they're, they're very self-evident in some cases. You can walk on them, you can, you know, hit them with your boat. Uh, these are considered non-sensitive, so we're, we're able to uh, do a presentation like this and much more freely uh, share information about them with the public. And so in that spirit, um, by all means, feel free to contact me if you'd like, uh, you know, more, more information about the two um, uh, kind of field investigations, or if your questions relate to something that um, may, maybe of more of an archival nature, um, or anything that Dan talked about, feel free to contact Dan. And then uh, Dave Conlon's uh, information is there as well. If you have, uh, you know, specific questions about how how they conduct. Um, their work at the Submerged Resources Center. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it's one of those cool opportunities to share that information. Well, I think, you know, sort of, um, I just want to sort of share this one, one thought before, and maybe uh, Jonathan and Dave, you got some other thoughts as well, if there's other questions. Uh, in response to Dave's, Dave's sort of last statement about what does it mean to have a wild and scenic river that has these things. Um, I think often when we're resource managers in the park service, we deal with a lot of known knowns, right? We deal with what we, what people know about a resource. We deal with what people 
um, expect to be important about a resource at the St. Croix River. And so we don't have as many opportunities to get out and really think about unknown knowns and discover new things and to sort of dig into a new research project. And I think this is one of those examples where um, the Park Service leadership and decision makers really said, hey, this is something new we can find out because Gene Sheppy Anderson discovered them and we you know, put some effort into researching them in my work uh, in 2012 to say, hey, look, you can, you can find out new things about resources. And they're not just sort of what we know is important about a national park. Um, but we can sort of expand, uh, expand what's what we understand, expand what we know, and sort of identify new things, which I think is really, really cool, uh, particularly uh, within the Park Service to be like, you know, look, this park put a, a really high premium on identification efforts uh, in a way that's really fantastic. Um, and so it's it's really been a, a pleasure to be participating in this project for so long, uh, and then to be asked to come back again because it is it has been a real treat in my career. Um, so yeah, it's it's really really cool in that way. We're getting close to the end of our time. We've got what looks like three minutes left. Last call on questions. I think we've addressed everything that's in the Q and A that I can see. Twice. Um, um, I just wanted to say myself, thank you all, Jonathan, uh, Dan, and Dave, for an amazing presentation. This is really, really. Fascinating. I love it. So, um, before we sign off, um, Jonathan, since you still have the control, um, can you um, please end the recording when we're when we're done before we sign off? Sure. Thank you. And to all participants, um, the recording will be available to you if you want to see it later. So. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. It's been a great session. Thanks for including us in the conference. We appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Right on. That's been fantastic. Thank you.